The male lead Michael is not only handsome, but also a smart engineer. He graduated from the University of Chicago and is a professional structural engineer. He left the bright road and went to rob a bank. He didn't run away after robbing the bank. He deliberately let the police catch him and put him in prison. What's more puzzling is that in court, the judge saw for the first time that the defendant did not defend himself and wanted to go to jail. Veronica was his defense attorney and she was very uncomprehending. Michael never had a violent tendency. Nor did he lack money. Why did he rob a bank? In view of his lack of criminal record and no injury to anyone, the judge was lenient. The judge respected Michael's request. He was locked up in a prison near his home. Fox River Prison, Michael heard the judge's verdict. He smiled on his face. Michael came to prison, he met Brad, the fierce captain of the prison guards. He was above everyone else here. Anyone who offended him would be worse than dead. His roommate Sucre had 16 months left before he was released from prison. He carefully introduced Michael to everything in prison. This old man who plays with cats is D.B. Cooper. He is a robber. He robbed $1.5 million 30 years ago. He never admitted this fact. This black guy is a department store. As long as you have money, he can get anything for you. This is a place where the weak are preyed on by the strong. The prisoners are divided into two gangs, black and white. It's best to stay away from them. Michael was not interested in these things. He only cared about one person, Lincoln. Sucre advised him not to mess with that person. Because he killed the vice president's brother, he will be executed in a month. No one here is more dangerous than him. So he was locked up alone. He only came out when he went to the prison factory for labor reform. Sucre was curious. Why was Michael interested in that person? Michael's answer surprised him. Because he's my brother. His brother was framed by someone. Michael was brought up by his brother since he was a child. He knew his brother wouldn't lie to him. He had to get his brother out of there. The next day, Michael found John who was playing cards. He was once the boss of the mafia. After he went to prison, he bribed the prison guards. He enjoyed some privileges here and managed the prison factory. Michael wanted to see his brother. So he asked John to take him to work in the factory. John faced Michael who had just arrived and told him to get lost directly. Michael put an origami crane on the table to keep him from disturbing his card game. John let his men drive Michael away. Back in his cell, Michael chatted with Sucre casually. At this time, a prison guard came over. He said that the warden wanted Michael to go over for a visit. Sucre felt bad. Here, no prisoner has ever attracted the attention of the warden. Sucre warned Michael to be careful. It turned out that the warden had already investigated Michael and knew that he was a high achiever from a prestigious university. The warden questioned Michael. Michael answered perfunctorily. The warden got straight to the point. Next month is his wedding anniversary with his wife. He wanted to give his wife a surprise. He planned to make a model of the Taj Mahal. A symbol of love. Finally, he found out that there was a problem with the structure of the Taj Mahal model. He happened to find out that Michael was a structural engineer. He asked Michael for help. This is something that many prisoners and guards dream of. Michael refused outright. His brother had only one month left before he was executed. He didn't have time to do this. On the other side, John's men received a call. They received an anonymous letter. Someone accused their gang of crimes and attached an origami crane. The police had already protected the witness. John thought of Mike's origami crane. He immediately went to find Michael. They fought each other. There is no such thing as self-defense here. As long as you fight, you will be punished. The warden retaliated by locking Michael up for 90 days in solitary confinement. Michael had to agree to fix the Taj Mahal model for the warden. He escaped a disaster. Black Boss John agreed to let Michael work in the prison factory. Michael could see his brother and discuss the escape plan with him. Next, Michael had to get close to the female doctor, Sarah. Michael had already investigated that she was the daughter of the current governor. Because of family conflicts, she came to prison to do what she loved. Michael used diabetes as an excuse to ask her to inject insulin. He took the opportunity to look out the window and plan the escape route. But there was a problem, he didn't have diabetes. Because he injected insulin, his hands started to shake uncontrollably. Sarah suspected that he might not have diabetes. She suggested that Michael do a test next time. Michael found the prison's drug god Benjamin. He asked him to help find a drug that could resist insulin. Seeing that Michael paid, he agreed. The day of work finally arrived. Michael got his wish and saw his brother Lincoln. He told his brother about the escape plan. 
his brother advised him not to take risks for himself. Even if they escaped, they would not be able to get anywhere without money. Michael didn't say anything. He turned his head and looked at D.B. Cooper who was taking off his shoes. His brother said that after going out, even if we have money, we have to hide our names. It's not easy for them to escape from this heavily guarded prison. Coincidentally, this prison was renovated a few years ago. The contractor was Michael's company. So Michael knew the structure of the prison very well. In order not to forget every corner, he engraved the blueprint of the entire prison on his body. Look closely for a few seconds, you will find that his tattoo hides a huge secret. This is the core of Michael's escape. He has mastered the structure of the prison. He next is to get the tools needed for escape. Michael took out a mirror and looked at his arm. He copied the mirrored English letters onto a piece of white paper. During the break, he quietly stole a bolt from the bar chair. It turned out that Michael had checked the information. This type of bolt can be ground into a wrench. Michael took out a coin and started to act. But just then, psycho killer Teabag came over with his boyfriend. This is Teabag's territory. He didn't let Michael leave. He looked at Michael with lustful eyes. Michael didn't like this kind of thing. He decisively rejected Teabag. Teabag was angry. He drove Michael away. The next day, Michael came here again to take the bolt away. This scene was seen by Teabag. Michael had no choice but to hand over the bolt to him. When the prison guard came, Teabag pretended to stretch his waist. He handed the bolt to his man. They escaped the interrogation of the prison guard by a narrow margin. At the same time, a gang war was brewing in the prison. Teabag, as a member of the white gang, was actively preparing for war. Michael took the opportunity to sneak into his room. He searched for the bolt taken by Teabag. Unfortunately, he was bumped into by Teabag who came back again. He calmly walked up to Teabag's face. This scene happened to be seen by Benjamin, the drug god across the street. He mistakenly thought that Michael had joined the white gang. The next day, Benjamin called Michael to a corner where no one was around. Then several black people came over and surrounded him. No matter how Michael explained, Benjamin would not believe him again. Michael, who was always calm and calm, also lost control of his emotions at this moment. Even if his plan was perfect, there were uncontrollable factors. Back in his cell, Michael was thinking about how to deal with it. The prison guard came over to count the number of people. A white man disobeyed and walked out of the queue. And the war broke out immediately. The prisoners fought with each other. Michael, who was innocent, was also thrown down from the floor. Teabag's boyfriend rushed towards Michael. He had long disliked Michael's handsome appearance. He was worried that his position in Teabag's heart would be threatened. He picked up a bolt and stabbed it at Michael's body. The skinny guy was no match for Michael at all. Michael subdued him and snatched away the bolt. Teabag's boyfriend attacked Michael again. A black man blocked the attack for Michael. And this scene happened to be seen by Teabag. He mistakenly thought that Michael had killed his boyfriend. Michael didn't have time to explain. And the prison guard threw a smoke bomb. Taking advantage of the chaos, he hurried back to his cell. Although he got the bolt, he also completely offended Teabag. An origami crane that even a primary school student can fold can become a tool for escape in Michael's hands. He took advantage of Sarah's inattention and put the origami crane into the sewer of the infirmary. The origami crane flowed down with the water and flowed to the sewer of the playground. It turned out that the sewer from the playground to the infirmary was connected. Michael noticed that there was a thick cable outside the window of the infirmary. The cable leads directly outside of the prison. He had to escape from prison, and the infirmary was a must-go place. He had to get along well with Sarah so he could get hold of her key to enter infirmary. So Michael used diabetes as an excuse to come here for insulin injections. Too much insulin injection caused his hand to shake involuntarily. This also aroused Sarah's suspicion. She suggested that he should do a test next time. Michael had no choice but to find Benjamin, who was known as the drug god in the prison. He asked him to help him get a pill that could resist insulin. Benjamin saw that Michael had a feud with Teabag. He then gave Michael the pill. Michael also passed Sarah's test in the end. He took his brother and ran away from the playground, which was definitely unrealistic. He had to open up a passage from his cell to the infirmary. When no one was around, he kept grinding the bolt on the ground. The bolt was soon ground into a hex wrench. He aligned the hex bolt with the tattoo on his arm, and the size was basically consistent. Michael inserted the bolt into the socket of the faceplate and twisted it gently. He quickly unscrewed the screw. The plan seemed perfect. He wanted to dig a hole in his cell, which was undoubtedly a huge project. Moreover, he had a roommate Sucre, under the same roof. Sucre would definitely find out. Michael wanted to pull Sucre into the group. The premise is that he had to verify whether Sucre was trustworthy. 
During one labor, Michael deliberately hid a cell phone in front of Sucre. He asked his brother to report it and framed Sucre. The prison guard immediately found Sucre. But this guy was very loyal. He didn't give up Michael. As a reward, Sucre asked Michael to lend him his phone. He wanted to call his girlfriend. But who knew? The phone was just a soap painted with black paint. Sucre felt that he had been played. He angrily questioned Michael what he meant. Michael told him his escape plan and stated that he wanted to pull him together. Sucre heard it and became even more angry. He thought that he would be out of prison soon. Waiting for him were his beloved girlfriend and a bright future. He didn't want to be involved, nor did he want to expose Michael. Therefore, he applied for a change of cell. On the other side, John's accomplice outside came to the prison again. He actually brought the black boss's child. He warned John for the last time. If he couldn't find out the whereabouts of the witness, he would kill John's wife and child. The threat of his accomplice made John uneasy. He knew very well that Michael wouldn't eat hard. At the same time, Teabag prepared a sharp serrated knife to avenge his boyfriend. He wanted to kill Michael. John took this opportunity. He tricked Teabag into his room and taught Teabag a lesson in front of Michael's face. From this moment on, John officially joined Michael's escape plan. John thought that he had been blackmailed in prison all the time, so he might as well escape and save his wife and child. With John's protection, Michael was very smooth in prison. Unfortunately, Brad found Michael a psychotic roommate because he had nowhere to live. He had to move here. Now there was a big problem. Either pull this psychotic into the team or dig a hole when he was asleep. That night, when everyone was asleep, Michael quietly got up and took advantage of the time to dig a hole. But when he turned back, the psychotic roommate was staring at him with wide eyes. Michael was completely desperate. Michael's current challenge is how to deal with this mentally ill roommate. Despite his mental issues, his IQ is extremely high. He has strong reasoning abilities and an exceptional memory. Due to brain damage, he doesn't need to sleep at night. This means that Michael has no opportunity to dig an escape tunnel. The only solution is to involve his roommate in the escape plan. Michael asks him if he wants to escape prison and what he would like to do after escaping. However, his roommate believes that he is just a mentally ill person and it doesn't matter where he goes. He says that even if he escapes prison, he will still end up in a mental hospital. These words leave Michael completely hopeless. Time passes slowly, and Lincoln's execution is less than a month away. Michael has to search for opportunities to escape in this tight situation. One day on the playground, Michael acquires a bottle of chemical agent from John. He mixes the chemical agent with his and his roommate's toothpaste. He goes to Sarah's infirmary and pours the chemical agent into the drain. The mixture of the two chemicals creates a highly corrosive liquid. He uses the liquid to burn through the pipes, preparing for the upcoming escape. Every day, his roommate questions Michael about his missing toothpaste. Michael dismissively answers his roommate's inquiries. His roommate tells Michael that he is being fooled and mocked. He keeps everything neat and organized. And in such a small place, how can something go missing? It becomes clear that this guy isn't actually dumb, and Michael constantly tries to avoid his gaze. He always appears behind Michael like a ghost. Moreover, he discovers the secret in Michael's tattoo. He stays up late at night and lifts Michael's shirt to observe his tattoos. He becomes completely obsessed with Michael's tattoos and even records them in a notebook using his extraordinary memory. Michael is driven crazy by his roommate. This roommate will eventually ruin his plan. Sucre finds Michael and expresses regret. He wants to join Michael in the escape plan. It turns out that a few days ago, Sucre's close friend visited the prison. Sucre's friend informed him that his girlfriend has fallen in love with someone else. And they are getting married soon. Sucre is furious and calls his girlfriend to confront her. His girlfriend tells him that she's turning 20 soon and doesn't have time to wait for him anymore. Everything will be too late for Sucre after he spends 16 more months in prison. Sucre doesn't want to wait another minute. He wants to escape and save his relationship. Michael is thrilled to see Sucre change his mind. The urgent task now is to get rid of this mentally unstable roommate. Michael is surprised to find that his roommate has assembled the pieces of his tattoo on paper using his memory. Michael approaches the door and forcefully slams into it. What are you nuts? When his roommate sees Michael covered in blood, an ominous feeling arises. Michael calls for the guards and accuses his roommate of having violent tendencies. Considering his mental illness, the guards take him away directly. Michael finally got rid of the mentally unstable roommate. Soon after, Sucre moved back in. Sucre observed the movements of the surrounding guards using a mirror. Michael unscrewed the screw from the basin, preparing to dig a hole. Sucre asked Michael why they were digging a hole here. 
corroding the infirmary's pipes. Michael explained that opening this wall was just the beginning of the escape plan. There are many rooms between here and the prison's outer wall. The infirmary is the closest room to the outer wall. The infirmary is a crucial exit for the escape. They need to create a passage from here to the infirmary. Michael took out a piece of paper to test the depth of the brick seam. Then, he instructed Sucre to make some noise. Understanding Michael's intention, Sucre started singing loudly. Sucre's off-key singing drew insults from their fellow inmates. Taking advantage of the chaotic commotion, Michael kicked the wall with his feet. He created a hole in the wall big enough for one person to crawl through. The appearance of a guard silenced the prisoners. Quietly, Michael crawled out of the cell. This was only the first step of the plan. Michael still needed time to study the escape route. When Michael returned to the cell, he saw the warden sitting in his room. An ominous feeling washed over him instantly. He noticed the leaking screw hole. The warden didn't notice anything unusual, but he delivered even worse news to Michael. He received instructions from higher authorities to transfer Michael to another prison, and the execution would take place tomorrow. Hearing this, Michael looked bewildered and desperately pleaded with the warden not to do this, but the warden remained unmoved because he too was being forced. There is a powerful force outside the prison. As Michael's brother had mentioned, the vice president's brother was not killed by Lincoln, he was framed to take the blame. A mysterious organization fabricated surveillance footage of the crime scene and killed all the witnesses. They accidentally discovered that Lincoln's brother is Michael, who was imprisoned for robbery. They also learned that the two brothers were locked up in the same prison, and the mysterious organization seemed to have figured out Michael's plan. They immediately made a phone call to a woman who was the real mastermind behind it all. This woman ordered her subordinates to find the warden and threaten him with his deceased illegitimate child. They forced the warden to transfer Michael to another prison. Although the warden owed Michael a favor, he had no choice but to comply for the sake of his family. Michael didn't give up. He sought out D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper said that if he wrote an application and used an excuse about feeling unwell, it could be resolved. Because the application was rejected, there would be at least a month-long process to go through. During this month, no one had the authority to make Michael leave. Michael suddenly realized what to do and immediately followed the advice. The warden received the application, and he reluctantly admitted that Michael had learned quite a lot. He considered the process to be reasonable and in compliance, silently consenting to it. Michael initiated the escape plan once again. He asked Sucre to pretend to hang clothes as a cover while he squeezed into the gap in the prison cell's structure to search for a passage to the infirmary. Michael discovered that there was a cement wall blocking the passage. Due to regular and unpredictable roll calls, he didn't have enough time to break through the wall. Michael hadn't even made a few hits when he was called back, wasting his time. Just when Michael was at a loss, clever Sucre came up with a solution. The day before, in order to buy time to break through the passage, Michael needed someone to create chaos. By having the guards put all the inmates in solitary confinement, the frequency of cell checks would be reduced. Only then could Michael's escape plan proceed smoothly. He entered the prison's internal structure and climbed into the air conditioning room to cut off the power directly. In the scorching summer, the prisoners suffered greatly from the heat. Led by Teabag, the prisoners started a riot, insisting they wouldn't go back to their cells without air conditioning. The inmates joined in the uproar. As the guards watched the furious prisoners, they announced that they would all be placed in solitary confinement, then fearfully retreated from the cell block. Amidst the chaos, the guards forgot to lock the inmates back in their cells. Brad wanted to teach the inmates a lesson but was mocked by Teabag instead. Teabag said only people who couldn't make it as police officers would become guards. Unable to tolerate the mockery, Brad retorted directly. Teabag was instantly enraged and led the inmates to shake the protective door violently. The protective door began to loosen, and Brad and the guards prepared to leave. The cell door was quickly breached and destroyed by the inmates. Teabag found a keychain in the control room. This meant that all the inmates in the prison could be set free. The prisoners searched for an exit, and Brad sensed that something was terribly wrong. He pulled out his gun and tried to charge at the inmates to eliminate them, but his colleagues stopped him just in time. The prison was full of desperate criminals, and the guards couldn't compete with them. Helplessly, Brad had no choice but to report to his superiors. On the medical ward side, the prisoners learned about the riot in the cells and revealed their true nature. They first knocked out the guards and plotted against Sarah. Seeing the dangerous situation, Sarah quickly hid in a room. She blocked the door with a table, trying to call for help, but the phone line had already been cut by the inmates. Led by a young African-American man, they desperately banged on the door, with one person even reaching inside, attempting to open it. Sarah picked up a sedative and injected it into the arm of the inmate, causing him to quickly pass out. 
Meanwhile, media outlets were reporting on the rebellion at Fox River Prison, and the news quickly reached the governor's office. As Sarah was the governor's daughter, the governor hurriedly dispatched special forces to the prison. Michael and Sucre took advantage of the prison chaos to study how to break through the wall. They had to connect the passage between the infirmary and the cell block to prepare for their escape. Teabag captured a guard and saw this as an opportunity to teach the guard a lesson. He brutally beat the guard and then threw him into Michael's room. He kicked the guard, who instinctively covered his face, accidentally knocking over the loose basin. Seeing the scene before him, Teabag was completely dumbfounded. He finally understood why Michael always seemed so secretive he was planning an escape. This scene was also witnessed by the guard. In order to break through the escape passage, Michael planned to use an egg beater to break through the half-meter thick cement wall. He hung a flashlight on a stand and covered it with a reflective cup made of aluminum foil. He placed a pre-drawn demonic pattern in front of the light, projecting the pattern onto the wall. Sucre was confused, thinking that only a hammer could break through the wall. Before he could finish speaking, Michael threw him a metal whisk. Sucre couldn't believe they were supposed to use the thing to break through the cement wall. Michael calmly explained that they just needed to make a few small holes in the wall to destroy it entirely. This is known as Hook's Law. Although Sucre didn't quite understand, he stopped asking questions and skeptically took the whisk to make holes in the wall. Meanwhile, the guards and Teabag discovered Michael's escape plan. Just as Teabag was about to reveal the secret, he was silenced by the arrival of John. Hearing the commotion, Michael climbed out of the hole. Michael thought to himself that since Teabag was serving a life sentence, it would be convenient to have him on their side. However, dealing with this guard wouldn't be easy. On the medical ward side, the prisoners were desperately banging on the glass. The prisoners had ill intentions towards the beautiful Sarah. Seeing the door about to be smashed open, Sarah picked up a piece of glass, preparing for the worst. This scene was caught on the surveillance monitor by Michael. He told his cellmate that they must not harm the guards and quickly went to rescue Sarah. Taking advantage of the chaos, John and Sucre returned to the passage to make more holes. To prevent Teabag from harming the guards, John had one of his men keep an eye on him. John believed that the guard was the only bargaining chip to prevent the special forces from launching a full assault. Michael quickly arrived at Sarah's room, and together they escaped the infirmary through the ventilation ducts. They found a safe spot and climbed down. Just as Michael was about to escort Sarah out of the prison, they were spotted by a sniper. Sarah decisively stood in front of Michael to prevent him from being shot. Just as they were figuring out how to escape, a prisoner burst into the room. In a critical moment, Michael pushed Sarah out and told her to run. Michael managed to dodge the situation by lying on the ground, causing the terrified prisoners to scatter. Taking advantage of the chaos, Michael escaped back into the cell block. After seeing his daughter safely outside, the governor had no more concerns. Although there was still one guard left in the prison, the governor didn't care at all and immediately ordered a full assault. Sucre and John completed all the holes as per Michael's instructions. Next came the verification of Hook's law. Excitedly, they returned to the cell block and greatly admired Michael. Teabag wanted to kill the guard because he was serving a life sentence. This hole was his only chance to escape. Ignoring everyone's pleas, he cruelly stabbed the guard to death. This is the most terrifying form of execution in the world. This person will face such punishment. The prison guard puts him on the electric chair and secures his limbs and neck with straps. A sponge soaked in water is placed on the prisoner's head to enhance conductivity. Finally. An iron helmet is placed over the prisoner's head. When a 50,000 volt current passes through a person's body, their fingers will bend severely. Sometimes their eyeballs will burst and hang from their cheeks. The skin in contact with the electrodes will be burned. Because the death scene is too horrifying, his face will be covered with a black cloth. Originally, this was just a dream of Lincoln's. 18 days later, he will be executed by electrocution, but he did not commit any crime. He was framed to rescue his brother. Michael spent three weeks finally breaking through the cement wall between the buildings. He can directly enter the infirmary from his own cell, and then escape from the infirmary. However, Lincoln is kept in solitary confinement for the death penalty, and Michael has no way to approach him. Michael studied the prison's blueprints. He discovered that the intersection of the steam pipe and the drainage pipe was a storage room. If a hole can be opened there, then everyone can converge in the infirmary. John told Michael that the area is off-limits. The prison factory workers never work there unless there is a fire that needs repair. After several negotiations, they carried flammable materials into the storage room. 
Just as they were about to open the door, the prison guard's gun was aimed at them. The storage room has already become the resting place for the prison guards, and the escape plan has reached a deadlock. When they were at a loss, they found out that D.B. Cooper could freely enter and exit the storage room. Lincoln said D.B. Cooper is trusted by the prison guards, but D.B. Cooper won't help anyone. Michael still decided to find him. No matter what Michael said, D.B. Cooper never admitted to hiding $1.5 million. D.B. Cooper did not agree to escape with Michael. He won't offend the prison guards just to help Michael. D.B. Cooper had just returned to his cell when Brad found him. As far as he knew, his colleague was killed during the riot and the body was right outside D.B. Cooper's dormitory. Brad wanted to get clues from him, but D.B. Cooper knew the rules of the prison. As long as someone snitches, that person cannot continue to survive in the prison. No matter how Brad pleaded with D.B. Cooper, he was ultimately politely refused. Brad, who didn't get any clues, immediately turned hostile and even touched D.B. Cooper's cat before leaving. The next day, D.B. Cooper saw the motionless cat on the bed, its body already stiff. He was in agony. This cat was his only spiritual solace in prison. Everyone knew that Brad killed his cat. For the first time, he showed a malicious expression. He went to the guard's restroom and placed a coffee pot with adhesive on the power source. He opened Brad's locker and took out a cigarette. Looking at the ugly picture on the wall, D.B. Cooper finally decided to light the lighter. Not long after, thick smoke emerged from the restroom. Michael saw the scene and was very happy. At this moment, D.B. Cooper walked past him. The fire in the restroom was quickly extinguished. Investigators found a cigarette butt at the scene. The warden looked at the cigarette butt and understood everything. Due to Teabag's lackey being killed during the prison riot, Teabag's good friend found him a new lackey. As long as you're in Teabag's pocket, he can guarantee your safety. Teabag killed a prison guard during the riot. Brad swore to find the killer. One day, Teabag's lackey found Brad and claimed to know who the killer was. The prison guards immediately moved in to make the arrest. The guards stormed into the inmate's room and found a photo under the mattress, showing the woman who was killed. A prison guard. That bed belonged to Teabag's friend. With all the evidence in hand, the guards took Teabag's friend away. It turns out, this was Teabag's trap. If someone doesn't take the blame for him, he will be discovered one day. Teabag's friend was betrayed like this. The plan was successful, and Teabag patted his lackey with satisfaction. Michael didn't want to let Teabag join, but Teabag found out about the escape plan and reluctantly agreed. To repair the burned-down restroom, the guards transferred John and the others to work there. Their task was to break through the ground and prepare for the future escape. They started smashing the floor with blankets as a barrier and assigned someone to keep watch at the door. During their break time, they threw the broken stones onto the courtyard. However, Benjamin discovered everything, but Benjamin didn't know what they were doing. Brad found John and threatened him, saying if the money doesn't arrive soon, someone else will take over managing the prison factory. It turns out that John was able to manage the prison factory before, because his company regularly sent money to Brad every month. But this month, Brad hadn't received any money. Upon hearing the news, John immediately called his subordinates. He learned that his company had gone bankrupt and was facing huge losses. If they lose the right to manage the prison factory, their plan will be exposed. On the other hand, Teabag's lackey sought help from Michael. Unable to tolerate Teabag's insults anymore, now Michael didn't want to offend Teabag and ignored him. A few days later, Teabag's lackey committed suicide, and Michael felt overwhelmed with guilt upon witnessing the scene. He made a secret vow to teach Teabag a lesson. John's roommate gained control of the prison factory. It was all arranged by Brad. They picked up their tools and headed towards the restroom where the secret was hidden. John watched as his roommate took over the work in the restroom, feeling extremely angry, because once they peel back the carpet, the plan will be completely exposed. He found his roommate and forced him to hand over control of the prison factory. The situation has changed drastically, and his brother has sided with his roommate. Watching this group of people going in and out of the restroom, Michael and the others became anxious. The only way to regain control of the prison factory is to continue sending money to Brad. The prerequisite for making money quickly is for Michael to provide information about the key witness. This will help John gain the support of his accomplices. As long as the trial takes place next month and the tainted witness testifies, John's accomplices will be put in prison. Michael decided to personally talk to his accomplices. In order to gain their trust, Michael explained in detail how he found the key witness. Before the witness was transferred to the jail, they would be protected by the local sheriff. There were four sheriffs in the area. Before entering the prison, Michael called the office and learned that three sheriffs were working as usual. 
Only one sheriff was on vacation and not with their family. It was clear that this person had been protecting the tainted witness. The authorities needed a few weeks to determine the witness's new identity. The guarding sheriff would definitely make a call home. Using phone records, Michael found the witness's address. Michael demanded $200,000 from the witness's compensation. The witness eventually agreed to Michael's request. Because they had to kill the witness. Otherwise they would all be charged and sent to prison. As they arrived at the location specified by Michael, a spotlight shone on them. The undercover police quickly apprehended them. It turned out that Michael had given them a fake address. The witness was a good person, just a warehouse custodian for John's company. One night, he accidentally stumbled upon the scene of John's murder. Being a just person, he decided to come forward and report it. Of course, Michael would not reveal the witness's true location. It was all part of the act he and John had staged. John regained control of the prison factory. The toughest part has been breached. And there are only 18 inches left to the tunnel. At the current pace, they estimated that they could escape on Friday. They were very excited, fantasizing about what they would do after escaping. However, at this moment, Brad brought Benjamin into the restroom. He had noticed the broken stones that Michael and the others had secretly thrown. So he bribed the newly appointed manager. He discovered Michael and the others' escape plan in the restroom. In order to join the escape team, Benjamin threatened them by stepping on the hole. In the end, he also became part of the escape plan. Using the opportunity of his wife's prison visit, Michael obtained a credit card. In someone else's hands, it was just an ordinary credit card. But in his hands, it was the key to escape. Sucre took out a mirror and saw that there was no one outside the prison. Michael took out the credit card from the lining of his clothes. Sucre looked puzzled and expressed concern about the consequences if they were discovered by the guards. Michael tore off the film of the credit card. It turned out to be an access card for the prison. Before entering Fox River State Penitentiary, Michael had already studied the access code. He wrote the code on a blank magnetic card and covered it with the credit card sticker. A seemingly ordinary credit card had been transformed into an access card. He needed to enter the inmate property room to retrieve two important items from before his incarceration. A pocket tape recorder and a gold watch. Michael brought his belongings to the underground tunnel. And as he was counting the items, he realized the gold watch was missing. That watch was crucial for his escape. Michael found the experienced D.B. Cooper and asked if he knew that guards would steal inmates' belongings. D.B. Cooper said that this was the most normal thing to happen. When you're out of prison, it's useless to try to recover lost items. Michael quickly identified the prison guard who stole his watch. He was the vain deputy captain of the prison, always wearing the watch to show off. Michael couldn't accuse him because he couldn't explain how he knew the watch was stolen. For now, the only option was to find a way to steal the watch back. At that moment, a hip-hop boy approached. He had been sentenced to five years for theft and came to find Michael in order to work in the prison factory. Coincidentally, Michael also needed his help. So they agreed to work together. Michael helped him get into the prison factory. And he helped Michael steal back the gold watch. The next day, a young man foaming at the mouth was pushed into the infirmary. It was the hip-hop guy. And Michael had to admit that his skills were impressive. One second the watch was on the deputy captain's wrist. And the next second it disappeared. The deputy captain didn't notice any of it. Back in the cell, the hip-hop guy had D.B. Cooper give the watch to Michael. That's when Michael invites D.B. Cooper to join the escape team. Michael was very surprised because he had invited him multiple times before. But he had never agreed. Now he was voluntarily joining the escape team. It turned out that earlier that morning, the warden had called D.B. Cooper to his office. He told D.B. Cooper that his daughter had been hospitalized due to esophageal problems. The doctors speculated that she might not survive another week. Their parole application was not approved, but they were allowed to let D.B. Cooper attend his daughter's funeral. The warden's words were like a bolt from the blue for the elderly D.B. Cooper. His daughter was his only family in this world. Regardless, he had to fight to see his daughter one last time. Therefore, he decided to join the escape team. Michael, however, was hesitant because all members of the escape team had to be valuable. He believed that D.B. Cooper had no money and would slow everyone down due to his age. The next day, D.B. Cooper found Michael again and handed him a Bible with $100 bills tucked inside. The serial numbers on the bills matched the ones lost by the bank. Michael was convinced that D.B. Cooper had hidden a lot of money outside. They would need that huge sum of money after the escape. So they agreed to let him join. There were already seven people in the escape team. And Michael realized that they were overloaded. Therefore, they had to kick someone out in order to ensure the smooth execution of the escape plan. A regular gold watch became a tool for Michael to escape. 
He unscrewed the back cover of the watch and opened the casing of the mini tape recorder. He connected the copper wire from the recorder to the gears of the watch, inserting the metal receiver. He used a rubber band to tie the watch and the recorder together. A simple timed recorder was then created by him. During labor time, Michael buried the timed recorder in the lawn. Only a small part was left exposed to capture sounds. At exactly 9 o'clock in the evening, the red light on the timed recorder lit up, and it began to collect nearby sounds. This way, he could accurately calculate the guard's movements and the time cycle at this location. Michael retrieved the recorder and discovered that the interval between each patrol by the guards was 18 minutes. This meant that when they escaped four days later, they would have only 18 minutes to crawl out of the infirmary window. The seven of them still had to pass through the cables and climb over the high walls. After calculations, it was determined that it would take five minutes for seven people to jump out of the ward window. It would take two minutes for each person to climb across the cable and the wall. Since the rope couldn't bear the weight of two people, they could only cross one by one. This meant that the 18 minutes would only be enough for six people to escape. To maintain stability, Michael only shared this plan with his brother. They had no choice but to kick one team member out. However, when they were discussing who to exclude, Benjamin, who was hiding in the corner, overheard their conversation. This news soon spread within the team. Each of them desired to escape and no one would voluntarily withdraw. Benjamin found Sucre and asked him to monitor Michael's every move. Teabag believed that D.B. Cooper was already old and escaping would be futile, so he threatened him to quit. John and Lincoln were looking for an opportunity to get rid of Teabag. Wiley Teabag had already anticipated everything. Confidently, he informed the others. He had already revealed the entire plan to his henchmen. If he didn't make it safely out of the prison, he would expose everything. After hearing this, everyone remained silent. But John decided to teach him a lesson by bribing the guards. John obtained Teabag's phone records and found the address of Teabag's cousin. John ordered his men to tie up his cousin and release him after they safely escaped. During the kidnapping, Teabag's cousin resisted with a gun and even used his own son as a shield. As a result, one of John's men accidentally killed both the father and son. Upon hearing this news, John felt guilty because he never killed children it was his principle. In fact, he would even have dreams at night where his own child was killed. The next day, John had his men drag Teabag into the workshop. As John's men prepared to kill him, a troubled conscience led John to intervene. He pointed a knife at Teabag's neck, forcing him to swear and voluntarily leave the escape team. Teabag pretended to agree to his request. But when John let his guard down, Teabag spat out a blade from his mouth and swiftly cut his throat while John wasn't paying attention. Covered in blood, John collapsed to the ground. Anything beside Michael could potentially be a tool for his escape. He arrived at the sewer and removed the buttons from his clothes, throwing them into the deeper part of the drain. Listening to the sound of the buttons hitting the ground, he calculated the time it took for the sound to reach him. He determined that the bottom of the reservoir was about one meter high from the slope mouth. So even if he slipped from here, he wouldn't break his leg. Michael looked up at the well opening, which was about four to five meters above him, and then glanced at the smooth walls around him. He thought it would be difficult to climb up from here, but this was the only way to escape, and he had to find a solution. After contemplating for a while, Michael looked at the semicircular drain at the bottom. He took out a plastic bag he had prepared in advance and filled it with clothes as padding. Then, he took out an 8-meter long rope and securely tied the plastic bag to it. Finally, he stuffed the bag into the drain to block it. Next, all he needed to do was open the water valve and fill the reservoir with water. Michael intended to use the buoyancy of the water to lift himself up. To his surprise, when he opened the water valve, not a single drop of water came out. Someone must have closed the main valve outside. The next day, during the collective labor time, Michael used a lever to pry open the main valve, and a large amount of water gushed out. Michael set the draining time to be 3 minutes and 17 seconds, and the water in the reservoir gradually began to rise. However, before the water could fully drain, a prison guard approached. D.B. Cooper promptly coughed, alerting Michael. The guard blew a whistle, signaling the prisoners to assemble and return to their cells. By this time, the pipes were almost filled with water, so Michael immediately closed the valve. After returning to his cell, Michael quickly made his way to the upstream drainage pipe. He took off his clothes, crawled into the water-filled reservoir, and held onto one end of the rope. With the help of the water's buoyancy, he swam to the top. Michael's calculations were extremely precise, and he reached the exact location. He pushed open the well cover and found himself in the pharmacy beneath the infirmary, just as he had marked it. A few days earlier, 
Michael had used chemical agents to corrode the sewer pipe under the infirmary, to avoid entering the wrong room. He had thrown a folded paper crane into the corroded iron plate using a mop. Michael tightened the rope and pulled hard. The drain at the bottom of the reservoir reopened, and the water level quickly dropped. Then he tied the rope to the well cover. Now, the escape route was fully open, Michael arrived at the corroded pipe and gently peeled off the iron plate. He could clearly see Sarah washing her hands, ready to proceed. Michael followed the drainage ditch back to the lounge area, where they had just finished connecting the pipes. At that moment, Lincoln, who was keeping watch at the door, spotted a guard approaching, he quickly alerted everyone, but Michael hadn't made it up yet, and they couldn't let the guard notice someone missing, in order to buy time for everyone, Lincoln had no choice but to confront the guard, other guards heard the commotion and rushed over to subdue Lincoln, Michael was pulled up by his fellow inmates, feeling extremely happy, he thought tonight they could start the escape, however, no one else shared the joy because Lincoln, the main protagonist, had been taken to solitary confinement, and tomorrow was his execution day. Meanwhile, John was injured and taken out of the prison by a helicopter, while Teabag pretended nothing had happened. The problem was that after their escape, they still needed John's plane to leave the United States. Without John's plane, even if they managed to escape, they wouldn't get far. Just as the prison break seemed to be succeeding, an unexpected turn of events occurred leaving Michael frustrated with his hands on his head. Everything he had done was to save his brother from prison, and if he couldn't accomplish that, it would all be meaningless. Michael was too hard on himself. He took out a razor blade, heated it with a lighter, and blew on it, rolling up his sleeve, mentally prepared. He found the location of his tattoo and cut into it directly. Sucre couldn't bear to watch, displaying a pained expression, enduring intense pain. Michael extracted a small black pill from under his skin. This was something Michael had prepared before entering prison because Lincoln was scheduled for execution the next day. He wants to use this little pill to save Lincoln. Michael knows that only the priest can see Lincoln now. So he lies and says that this necklace is important to Lincoln. He asks the priest to pass the necklace to Lincoln, and the priest agrees to his request. When Lincoln gets the necklace, he knows that his brother will never give up on him. He carefully studies the necklace and opens its case, discovering a black pill inside. There is also a note that says to take it at 8 o'clock. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they are called out to work, they go to the break room, and Michael officially announces that they will leave at 9 o'clock sharp. Teabag looks confused and says that they will be taken back to prison at 5 o'clock. Michael takes down the plasterboard from the wall and touches the pipes with his hand. He swings the hammer a few times and smashes the pipe. Brad quickly arrives, and they all sit on the floor like a group of children who have made a mistake. Michael explains that he accidentally broke the pipe while working, and the whole room is flooded with water. If they don't fix it today, the plasterboard will get moldy. His companions express their unwillingness to work overtime. Brad tells them that they must finish it tonight. Seeing their plan succeed, everyone bursts into laughter. But Michael can't be happy, because his brother is still in solitary confinement. Whether they can successfully save him is still unknown. At 8 o'clock in the evening, Lincoln takes the pill on time. Soon he starts vomiting and having diarrhea, and then the guards rush him to the infirmary for treatment. Finally, 9 o'clock arrives. Everyone lifts the carpet and locks the door with an iron rod. With a command from Michael, they follow the pipeline and successfully reach the pharmacy below the infirmary. When Nike looks at the pipes on the ceiling, his smile freezes instantly. The corroded sewage pipeline has been replaced with a brand new one. It turns out that this afternoon, a janitor came to collect garbage in the infirmary and accidentally saw the corroded pipe. So he asked a repairman to fix it, and they used a thicker pipe for replacement. Using steel pipes doesn't work, which means the escape route is completely blocked. On the other side, Lincoln in the infirmary is also trying to poke the pipe with a mop, but to no avail. It seems that the last time the two brothers will meet is at the gallows tomorrow. To save a person with a rat, this idea is really far-fetched. Michael puts some snacks in his pocket, moves the sink aside, and with Sucre's cover, enters the escape tunnel. He opens the snacks and places them on the ground, quickly attracting a hungry rat, then captures it. Because the corroded sewage pipeline in the infirmary has been fixed, the only exit has been sealed off. The escape team has to return to their cells again. The next day, during rest time, Michael finds D.B. Cooper to seek some solutions from him. D.B. Cooper says that when he was young, there was a person sentenced to the electric chair. Later, because the fuse of the electric chair blew, the person lived another three weeks. 
Executing the electric chair again requires a series of complicated procedures, such as obtaining a new death warrant and death notification. Michael ignites hope once again. Three weeks are enough for him to prepare for the next escape plan. So, Michael comes up with the idea of using rats to sabotage the circuits. He never expected that such a perfect plan would be ruined by a small thief. Previously, in order to get into the prison factory, Michael promised the hip-hop guy that if he retrieved his watch, he would let him into the prison factory. However, with too many members in the escape team, Michael rejected his inclusion, which left him resentful. Brad, unable to find any leverage against Michael, bribed the hip-hop guy with a hamburger. He made him his informant to spy on Michael. The hip-hop guy told Brad about what he heard regarding the electric chair and Lincoln. Brad immediately went to the execution room and ordered his men to test whether the electrical circuit was functioning properly. They went to the electrical room and upon careful examination, they found that a rat had damaged the wires. In order to ensure that Lincoln's execution proceeds smoothly, Brad demanded that the electrician fix the wires immediately. And then he headed towards Michael's cell. When Michael saw Lincoln, who was about to be executed. The two of them didn't say anything, they just held each other tightly. Lincoln still couldn't escape his fate of being electrocuted. Michael wanted to make one last struggle, but his brother had already accepted reality. Lincoln knew that many people had sacrificed too much for him. Perhaps this was his destiny. In the last few hours of his life, all he wanted was to spend them quietly with his brother. The time for the execution quickly arrived. As Lincoln was a repeat offender, he was personally escorted by the warden. However, while Lincoln was being transported, the governor suddenly called. Earlier in the morning, Michael took the opportunity of administering insulin to inform Sarah about Lincoln's framing. He pleaded with Sarah to seek justice from her governor father. Due to Michael's charming personality and multiple encounters with him, Sarah developed feelings for him. So she sought out Veronica, the lawyer responsible for the case. She brought the evidence collected by the lawyer to her father. Just when everyone saw a glimmer of hope, the warden spoke up. It turned out that Lincoln had been framed by the vice president, and he was simply a scapegoat. The governor, concerned about his own political career, certainly wouldn't care about the life or death of a small individual. The prison guard strapped Lincoln's limbs onto the electric chair. To increase conductivity, the guard shaved off his hair and placed a metal helmet with wet sponges on his head. All the preparations were complete, and the execution began right on time. The warden gave Brad a signal and Brad pulled back the curtains. Lincoln bid farewell to his loved ones. Suddenly, Lincoln saw a familiar face and tried to lip-sync to Michael, telling him to turn around. Michael didn't understand what he meant. And in the end, Lincoln was still forced to wear the helmet and endure this cruel torture. At that crucial moment, the phone rang, and the curtains closed. Michael looked panicked, unaware of what was happening. Michael and Veronica silently prayed for Lincoln. The warden announced that a higher court had received new evidence and the execution would be postponed. Lincoln, who narrowly escaped death, emerged. He told Michael that he saw their father. Michael was astonished. Their father had abandoned them 30 years ago. It was impossible for him to suddenly appear now. It was only when Veronica found the judge that they learned about an anonymous letter received, containing a coroner's report on the vice president's brother. The deceased had an appendix, but the vice president's brother had undergone an appendectomy at a young age. This indicated that the deceased was not the vice president's brother. Although this did not prove that Lincoln was innocent of murder, it at least showed that there was a massive conspiracy involved. The news quickly reached the vice president, who learned that Lincoln was not executed and immediately ordered her subordinates to investigate the reason. According to surveillance footage, the person delivering the anonymous letter was very cautious, but through the reflection on the glass door, his appearance could be clearly seen. That person was Lincoln's father whom the vice president's subordinates also recognized. From her expression, it was evident that they were old adversaries. Michael gathered his team to begin a new round of escape planning. The current plan is to reach the wellhead in the courtyard through the lounge corridor and then walk 50 meters to the psychiatric hospital. Finally, they would go through the sewer system in the psychiatric hospital area and make their way to the infirmary. The major issue is that they might be spotted by prison guards while crossing the courtyard. Michael knows this is the only way to escape so he decides to explore the route at night to familiarize himself with it. The underground pipes in the psychiatric hospital area have been extensively modified, making the layout complex. In preparation for this day, Michael had tattooed the pipe layout on his back in advance. Sucre is extremely worried, but just as he's getting desperate, he sees his cousin, giving him an idea. His cousin's job is to clean clothes for both prisoners and guards. 
Sucre borrows a set of guard uniforms from him so that Michael won't be noticed when coming out of the sewer system, successfully evading the searchlights. Michael pretends to need the restroom and manages to blend in within the psychiatric hospital area. Using the map's guidance, he quickly finds the manhole cover leading to the infirmary. However, on his way back, he unexpectedly encounters a patrolling guard. Michael hides in a corner, not daring to make a sound even though he gets burned by a pipe. To avoid being discovered and raise any alarms, he must quickly take off the guard uniform. At this moment, the fabric of the clothes has already stuck to Michael's burnt skin. After much hesitation, Sucre ultimately helps Michael remove the uniform. Michael lets out a pain cry. And ultimately, he is caught by the prison guard. The warden interrogates Sucre about why he attacked Michael. Unable to come up with an answer, Sucre ends up being put in solitary confinement for a day. Michael is taken to the infirmary, where Sarah asks him what happened, but he remains silent. Sarah discovers fibers from a material that resemble the fabric of guard uniforms among the clean substances, which raises her suspicions about him. Returning to his cell, Michael removes the bandage from his wound and realizes that the burn aligns perfectly with the underground pipe map. Without the guidance of a map, they would not be able to escape from the complex pipes. And the prison break plan was in jeopardy. Sarah was worried about Michael being bullied by the guards, so she reported the matter to the warden. The warden instructed Michael to identify the guilty guard. Unable to answer, Michael ended up being put in solitary confinement. All their efforts seemed futile, and Michael looked at his clothes, putting them in his mouth and tearing them apart with force. He kept recalling the prison map in his mind, trying to construct it using strips of fabric. Despite his continuous attempts, he couldn't recreate it. Michael completely lost his sanity, punching the walls relentlessly, not feeling any pain even as blood flowed. The guards noticed Michael's deteriorating state and urgently called for a doctor. Sarah arrived at the solitary confinement cell and saw the walls covered in patterns made with blood. With hands covered in blood, Michael sat motionless, and Sarah lifted his head. Michael's eyes were vacant, his face devoid of any expression, leading her to conclude that he had lost his sanity. Sarah called the warden who upon seeing Michael in this state, instructed her to take him to the psychiatric hospital area. Witnessing Michael becoming mentally unstable, Sarah felt somewhat disheartened. As soon as the doctor left, Michael, with a vacant gaze, suddenly returned to normal. It turned out to be his scheme. Pretending to be mentally ill was his way of getting into the psychiatric hospital area. He wanted to find his former cellmate, Charles, and plan for him to redraw the lost map. He mentioned that Charles's theory was correct. It was indeed a map of the pipes. He tried to jog Charles's memory and get him to draw it. Charles's response devastated Michael he didn't remember him at all. Patiently, Michael engaged in conversation with Charles, discussing their past and the map. Charles leaned in, observing Michael closely, finally recognizing him Michael was the one who stole his toothpaste. The mentally ill patients have to take tranquilizing medication every day. Because Michael was feigning illness, he knew that he didn't need to take the medication. He tried to resist, but was forced to swallow the pills anyway. After the doctor left, he spat up the pills he had hidden in his mouth. And then he found Charles to continue helping him recall the details of the tattoo. Due to the medication, Charles's mind became muddled and chaotic. To keep him alert, after taking the pills, Michael would dig them out of his mouth. Through Michael's relentless efforts, Charles finally regained his previous memories. Michael brought paper and pen, bearing his back for Charles to complete the missing parts of the map. At the same time, Charles also remembered how Michael framed him. What was even more dangerous was that he figured out it was a prison break map. He held the map and pressured Michael into taking him along, and Michael reluctantly agreed. Relying on memory, he drew a map, but not just one. That night, he attempted a discreet escape, but triggered an alarm before even leaving. He thought Michael was setting him up again. He tried to resist but was subdued by the doctors with electric shocks. After obtaining the drawings, Michael asked the doctors to inform Sarah that his mental condition had returned to normal. He pleaded with Sarah to find a way to get him out of there. Sarah told Michael that the warden demanded he reveal the truth about his burn injury. Otherwise, the warden would continue to keep him in solitary confinement. By that time, if Michael appeared mentally unstable, he would still be sent back here. To think that such a humane place existed within the prison walls. He took small sips oozing charm and allure. Teabag's biggest obsession was the exposed underwear of that person, and it was because of that underwear that the entire prison break team was saved. They were in the common room discussing their escape plans when a guard approached. He said that Brad complained they were working too slowly, 
and tomorrow they would bring in professional workers for renovation. Once they arrived, the prison break plan would be completely exposed. When everyone was at a loss, Michael revealed his plan. At that moment, another guard approached Michael and informed him that the warden wanted to see him. Before leaving, Michael finished explaining his plan. The remaining people were called to the yard to work. Now the problem was that someone had to return to the common room at night to cover up the hole. All eyes turned to Sucre because he was Michael's roommate, and he was the only one who could go back to the common room tonight. Sucre disagreed. Even if he patched up the hole and returned, he wouldn't be able to escape. If caught, he would face 10 years of imprisonment. If he refused to go, the entire team would be in danger. Just as Sucre was at a loss, he saw that man and instantly had an idea. He found Teabag and asked him to steal that man's red underwear. Teabag reluctantly agreed for the sake of the whole team. Soon, he brought Sucre what he wanted. Late at night, Sucre moved the sink and made his way to the common room, quickly covering up the hole. On his way back, he was caught by a spotlight and taken to the interrogation room. Brad interrogated him about why he wanted to escape. Sucre claimed he didn't want to escape, but someone threw something to him from outside. Brad ordered his men to search Sucre and indeed they found something. So Sucre was also put in solitary confinement. With three key members of the escape team now in solitary confinement, the prison break plan faced another crisis. Since both Michael and Sucre were in solitary confinement, their cells were temporarily vacant. The deputy captain examined Michael's room and realized it was one of the better cells in the prison. He planned to auction off the cell. Prisoners who came to visit during their break were constantly streaming in, and someone even raised the price to $200. As the person was about to leave, he noticed a leaking sink and said he would only pay once it was fixed. The deputy captain agreed to have it resolved within a day and submitted an application to the maintenance department. Teabag, who was next door, noticed everything and immediately sought out Benjamin and D.B. Cooper. If maintenance personnel were to come, they would surely discover the escape tunnel. Exposing their entire prison break plan, Benjamin found the deputy captain and decided to book Michael's cell for $500. Although he had made quite a bit of money in prison, most of it had been borrowed by his former underlings, so he had to collect debts. Since joining the escape team, his brothers had kicked him out of the gang. Not only did he not receive his money, he was also beaten up, leaving him completely helpless. D.B. Cooper, although wealthy, didn't have access to his money outside of prison. Teabag came up with an idea and looked towards the Mexican guys behind them. He knew they would bribe the guards at night and gather in the kitchen for gambling. He believed he could win money with his gambling skills, but he didn't have the initial $50 capital. At that moment, D.B. Cooper remembered that he had given Michael a Bible, inside which there was a $100 bill. It should still be in Michael's cell. So, he used the excuse of wanting to see Michael's room and convinced the guards to open the cell. Taking the opportunity to take the Bible, he handed $100 to Teabag, staking their lives on tonight's gamble. With Teabag and Benjamin's perfect coordination, they quickly won $500. Benjamin handed the money to the guards. By this time, the price had already been raised to $700. Helpless, Benjamin had to find D.B. Cooper and ask him to bring out his gold pocket watch. The guards' greed seemed insatiable, no matter how much they offered. In a desperate moment, Lincoln came up with an idea and asked Sucre's cousin to complete the task. Sucre's cousin then told Michael about the plan. He secretly took the burned police uniform and gave it to D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper went to the common room and placed the uniform in the guard's locker. Michael filed a complaint with the warden, claiming that the deputy captain had injured him and stolen D.B. Cooper's gold pocket watch. The warden headed straight to the guard's rest area. In his wardrobe, he found $500, the burned clothes, and D.B. Cooper's gold watch. With both witness and physical evidence, the guard had no chance to defend himself and was ultimately fired. As he left, Bellic bid him farewell. Michael and Sucre successfully returned to their cells, and the prison break plan was back on track. At that moment, a bus drove into the prison. It turned out John had recovered and returned. The young hip-hop guy was feeling miserable, as returning to his cell each time was a nightmare for him. He would always hide in a corner and cry alone. He wasn't really a bad person. He had only stolen a baseball card, which landed him in prison. Unaware of its high value, Michael approached him and asked for help in stealing something the key to the infirmary door. Because the new route required passing through the infirmary and climbing out through the window using the cable. In exchange, the boy wanted Michael to help him kill his roommate. This request crossed Michael's moral line, and they ultimately didn't reach a cooperation agreement. Helpless, Michael had no choice but to do it himself. 
He planned to seize the opportunity during a medication exchange to obtain the key. Seeing Sarah's care for him, Michael kissed her and expressed his love. Although the key was right in front of him, Michael couldn't bring himself to take it. He had to call the stripper for help. Michael paid to redeem her freedom, and she was very grateful. She didn't want to get involved in the case and agreed to help Michael one last time, after which they would have no more debts between them. Taking the opportunity when Sarah finished work, the stripper approached her. She said she had something important to discuss with Sarah. Regarding Michael, Sarah followed her to a cafe. But before she could say much, the stripper was in a hurry to leave. Then, using the excuse of visiting, she found Michael and handed him the stolen key. The young hip-hop guy was being abused by his roommate again. He pretended to invite his roommate onto his bed. But when the big guy was ready for pleasure, the boy pulled out a blade. Word of this incident spread throughout the prison, and Sucre also told Michael about it. The big guy didn't accuse the boy because he didn't want him to be put in solitary confinement. That way, he could seek revenge once he recovered. Feeling guilty for betraying the boy before, Michael decided to escape with him. He found the boy and explained the specific escape plan to him. Sarah returned to the infirmary and realized that the key was missing. She wondered about the stripper's strange behavior. Later, she checked the visitor log and indeed found that the woman had been to the prison. Michael took the opportunity to return the key, but it didn't matter anymore. Sarah understood that she was just a tool for Michael, and his confession had ulterior motives. She didn't know what Michael was planning, so she decisively had the locks changed. Seeing the changed locks, Michael felt desperate. To make matters worse, the boy had no intention of joining Michael. He used Michael's secret as leverage and asked Brad to change rooms for him. Brad. Who knew the news, went to the common room and started pounding the ground with a sledgehammer, discovering something unusual. Brad uncovered the carpet and indeed found the escape tunnel. At that moment, D.B. Cooper grabbed a shovel and swung it at him. Brad caught the shovel and landed several punches on D.B. Cooper to prevent their escape plan from being exposed. He grabbed a water bottle and smashed it against Brad, knocking him unconscious. During the scuffle, D.B. Cooper's abdomen was cut by glass. He endured the pain and removed the glass. Looking at the unconscious Brad, Cooper decided to tie him up and throw him into the hole. D.B. Cooper cleaned up the break room and left. He found the other members and informed them of the situation. Originally, the plan was to escape in three days, but now they had to do it earlier. If the prison guards discovered Brad's disappearance, they would lock down the entire prison until he was found. Michael had John contact the airplane for pickup, arranged for Benjamin to get bleach from the kitchen, and took charge of obtaining the keys. The others figured out ways to remove their body odors to evade detection by police dogs. They planned to escape from Michael's room at 7 p.m. that evening. Sucre reminded Michael that Lincoln was still in solitary confinement. Under 24-hour surveillance, if they couldn't rescue him, the plan would proceed as scheduled. They couldn't let everyone be punished because of one person. Michael reluctantly nodded in agreement. The prison guards began discussing Brad, noting that he had never been late or absent since his first day of work. Hearing this, the escape team became even more anxious. Despite feeling guilty about the young informant, Michael informed Brad about tonight's escape operation. Michael took the opportunity to find Sarah while pretending to exchange medication and told her about the escape plan. She was surprised and questioned why he was telling her all this. Michael replied that only she could save the escape team and advised her not to lock her door after work. Apparently, the infirmary was their escape route. Sarah felt manipulated by Michael from the beginning. Michael admitted he did use her initially, but later developed genuine feelings for her. Michael couldn't expect forgiveness from Sarah because everything had been too cruel for her. He now only wanted to rescue his innocent brother. Sarah left without answering, slamming the door behind her. Michael prayed in his heart that Sarah would help him this time. The warden called Michael into his office to express gratitude for the Taj Mahal model he had completed. He said he owed Michael a favor and asked him to speak up if he needed anything. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Michael requested to see Lincoln. He informed his brother about tonight's escape plan. However, Lincoln was in solitary confinement, chained and unable to escape. Lincoln urged Michael to leave him behind. Otherwise, none of them would get away. Michael was deeply saddened because if he couldn't save his brother, his meticulously planned escape would lose its meaning. John secretly grabbed a handful of dried feces when the prison guards weren't paying attention and hid it in his pocket. Back in his cell, he scattered the feces onto his bed sheets. Teabag also collected foul beans and crushed them before smearing them on his bed. 
Benjamin concealed the bleach in his clothes and distributed it to the other members outside the kitchen, they needed to bleach their prison uniforms before the free time began, as they would pass through the psychiatric hospital section where the uniforms were white. Just as Sucre was bleaching his clothes, a prison guard suddenly approached. Sucre quickly sat on the toilet, pretending nothing was amiss. The warden prepared to have the Taj Mahal model moved but it collapsed just as they lifted it. They immediately called for Michael to fix it, watching Michael being taken away. Everyone felt anxious. All of this was within Michael's expectation. Michael intentionally removed the support frame of the model, causing it to collapse because he wanted to see the warden one last time. Michael took out a small knife and coerced him to move Lincoln to the infirmary, ensuring that Lincoln would stay there all night. Then he tied up the warden, hid him in the closet, and knocked him unconscious. He picked up the telephone receiver and placed it on the table. As he left, he told the secretary at the door that the warden was in a phone conference and didn't want to be disturbed. The secretary glanced at the phone and confirmed that it was on a busy line, since Michael often visited the warden's office. She had no suspicion. The action is about to start, and everyone is very nervous. Each person imagined the situation after they escaped, and the process seemed very long, with only five minutes left until the escape. Everyone anxiously waited. Sucre sat on the bed trembling nervously, while Michael rubbed his hands anxiously. Teabag also prepared himself. And at that moment, he glanced at John. From John's eyes, he seemed to perceive a hint of hostility because they had a previous conflict. Formerly, one of Benjamin's subordinates made a boxing gesture towards Benjamin. He planned to kill Benjamin during free time because of an argument with Benjamin when he was stealing bleach in the kitchen. <laughs> When he was free, Benjamin hid in Michael's room when he saw his former subordinates bringing someone. They came to Michael's room but couldn't find Benjamin, so they reluctantly left. Fortunately, Benjamin had hidden in the escape tunnel. Narrowly escaping danger, Sucre pulled down the curtain, and one by one, they crawled into the hole behind the sink. After entering the pipeline, they heard deafening screams. At this time, Brad regained consciousness and used the corners of the walls to tear the tape. With his loud cry for help, two prison guards outside faintly heard his voice, and they hurriedly returned to the break room. In a critical moment, Teabag arrived and covered Brad's mouth. Michael took off Brad's uniform and put it on himself. They quickly reached the location beneath the exercise yard. They had to pass through the most dangerous area and then enter the psychiatric ward. Three watchtowers kept an eye on this distance. After everyone changed into bleached prisoner uniforms, Michael went alone to the alarm system. He took out the powder and blew it towards the button, causing a row of fingerprints to appear on it. Arranging the numbers in combination, Michael successfully triggered the alarm. Startled by the alarm, everyone was terrified. But Michael promptly explained that he triggered it, because only this way could the prisoners in the psychiatric ward be released. Once safety was ensured through inspection, the guards ordered the prisoners to return to their cells, and the team blended in with them. One of the guards recognized John and secretly informed Michael, dealing with the guard. They entered the sewer and arrived at the infirmary. Lincoln was being watched by a guard in the infirmary. However, as the guard turned his head, the escape team had already reached him. He had no choice but to obediently unlock Lincoln's handcuffs and promise not to call the alarm. Teabag still punched him down. Lincoln tries to pull Michael up, but there's always a little distance between them. They arrived at the entrance of the infirmary, and at this point, Michael could only pray that Sarah hadn't locked the door. The door opened, they successfully entered the infirmary. At this point, they only needed to remove the window and the security mesh. Then they could climb over the wall along the cable. Michael opened the fire hydrant and took out the fire hose, tying one end to the security mesh and the other end to the elevator's handrail. He would use the power of the elevator to pull down the security mesh. They covered the ground with sponge pads to prevent the windows from falling and causing a loud noise. At a critical moment, the elevator door wouldn't close. Michael tried again but to no avail. They didn't have much time left. Then, a hip-hop guy stepped forward. He entered the elevator and kept his hand on the elevator button, forcing the door to close. As the elevator descended, the fire hose gradually tightened, and the security bars were pulled open. When everyone took off their prison uniforms and prepared to climb out, an unexpected visitor arrived. It was Charles. He held a walkie-talkie and threatened them. He said he would call the police if they didn't let him escape with them. Helpless. Michael reluctantly agreed to take him along. Lincoln went first, laying a sheet on the iron mesh and then instructing the others to act quickly. John suggested lining up an alphabetical order by name so that he could be the first to leave. The others didn't dare to object because they still relied on John's plane to escape. 
The bolt securing the cable had already started to loosen, suddenly, the injured D.B. Cooper fell to the ground and couldn't get up. He knew he couldn't escape and told Michael where he had the money, Twin K Town in Utah. That money wasn't just $1 million, it was a whopping $5 million. Cooper hoped that Michael would give half of the money to his daughter, and the rest they could divide among themselves. Michael promised to fulfill D.B. Cooper's final wish. Teabag, who was nearby, overheard this and started to get restless. The warden's secretary seemed to notice something strange. She opened the door and found that the warden was missing, so she immediately called the guards. They discovered the warden locked in a closet after dialing his phone. The warden immediately ordered the alarm to be sounded, and the guards with police dogs searched for the escapees. At this point, only Michael and Sucre's cousin remained. Besides D.B. Cooper, Sucre's cousin urged Michael to go first. Hearing the alarm, Lincoln became extremely anxious, but luckily the searchlights didn't spot him. Just as Michael was about to reach the end, Sucre's cousin also climbed onto the cable. Due to the excess weight, the cable was pulled down, and Michael was left hanging in midair. Lincoln tries to pull Michael up, but there's always a little distance between them. At that moment, the guards spotted Sucre's cousin and pinned him to the ground at gunpoint. Lincoln took the opportunity to rescue Michael. Under interrogation by the guards, Sucre's cousin revealed the list of escapees. When the warden arrived at the infirmary, D.B. Cooper had already passed away. The prisoners learned about their fellow inmates' successful escape and celebrated wildly. The warden knew that if he couldn't catch them, it would be a disgrace to his career. By now, 15 minutes had passed since the prisoners escaped from the prison. The warden assembled all the guards and started the pursuit, authorizing the use of lethal force if necessary. Brad was rescued and asked his men to bring him a hunting rifle. He wanted to regain his dignity. The escape team didn't go far. They hid in the nearby bushes. No one could imagine that they were still close to the prison. Their scent had been eliminated, making them undetectable even by police dogs. However, Charles hadn't eliminated his own scent, so he would undoubtedly be a burden to everyone. Therefore, Lincoln and John staged a good act. They successfully ditched Charles, but the atmosphere inside the car remained tense. Teabag noticed John sitting behind him. Originally, John wanted to use the gun hidden under the seat to kill him. Teabag was prepared and handcuffed himself to Michael. John had to stop because he still relied on Michael to reveal the witness's testimony. They were five kilometers away from the airport and could successfully leave the United States as long as they boarded the plane. What they didn't know was that John's plane could only accommodate three people. Other than Michael and Lincoln, John had no intention of taking anyone else with him. Investigators found no signs of forced entry into the infirmary door. It was evident that someone deliberately left the door open for the prisoners. The warden threatened the doctor, stating that if she didn't report any information, she would not only lose her job but also be thrown into prison, helplessly. The doctor confessed and said that Sarah liked Michael. Finally, the warden understood that it must have been Sarah who intentionally forgot to lock the door. The police arrived at Sarah's house and found that she had injected a large amount of morphine and was in a severe coma. Veronica discovered through investigation that the vice president had bought a villa by a remote lake. She found the villa and sneaked inside quietly. She saw a disheveled old man sleeping in a chair and was certain that he was the vice president's brother. Just as Lincoln said, he didn't commit murder. He was framed by someone else. The vice president's brother was the CEO of a conglomerate. She created the fake death case for her brother to obtain his wealth. Lincoln was just a sacrificial pawn in this political struggle. The escape team encountered checkpoints along the way and chose to take a detour, but their car got stuck in the mud. With only three kilometers left to the airport, they decided to run there. Michael stopped the hip-hop guy because they had an agreement earlier that they owed each other nothing after leaving the prison. The guy left them and ran for his life alone. The search helicopter had arrived, but they were not detected. They found a car and Sucre quickly tried to start it. John opened the hood and discovered that the car didn't even have an engine. They continued running and found a warehouse along the way. Since Michael and Teabag were handcuffed together, their movements were slow, and they would eventually burden everyone. They wanted to forcefully break the handcuffs, but they were too strong to be broken open. While Teabag was feeling triumphant, John approached carrying an axe, leaving Teabag stunned. That's how Teabag lost one hand. They hurriedly made their way towards the airport but didn't expect that their plane had already been discovered by the police. John's men also sensed something was wrong and decided to leave first. When the escape team arrived at the airport, the plane had already taken off. Their hopes were shattered once again, and they could only begin a new round of life-or-death escape.